Thanks very much. Some fantastic presentations this morning, and I think you're going to have a really great two days. A lot of, a lot of wisdom and knowledge coming out here. In my part today, I'm going to talk about something that I hope will be uplifting. We, you hear a lot of gloom and doom at these conferences, and uh, I want to give you something today that uh, is going to helpfully give you some tools and techniques to use as you try to manage this really difficult space of cybersecurity. But before, before we get into the details of the presentation, I'd like to stop just for a moment. I see we have some folks here, uh, active duty military, I think maybe Army or Air Force, maybe some Navy folks. I want to thank them for their service once again and giving us the chance to do this what we do. Thank you guys very much. You know, what they do day in and day out, uh, we think we have problems in cybersecurity. These, these war fighters get up every day and they do Herculean tasks. And one of the things that keeps me up at night, that's kind of become an old cliche now, but you know, we defended this country for 241 years at our last birthday. And we've done it pretty darn well through the kinetic space. And I think the really game-changing activity today is that cyberspace now has become fully immersed in everything that we do. You heard this morning with Dan Gere's great talk how complexity and the total dependency on cyber, it's everywhere. I call it pushing computers to the edge. Trillions of devices are projected in the next 15 to 20 years. So the question that I worry about every day is how do we defend the country moving forward into the 21st century with this total dependence on the technology. And I think you heard some things this morning that are really important to take away. I believe this is not a problem that's so hard we can't solve it. I think one of the things that we wrestle with every day is innovation. We love the technology. In fact, it's kind of in our American DNA. We're innovators. We produce new technologies. And we're also great consumers of that technology. And when you have that appetite for the technology, and the freedom to produce those innovations, you're gonna get a massive deployment of this technology. And what does that equate to? That's increasing attack surface. And that's the biggest problem we have today. And it hits every part of the critical infrastructure. It hits every federal, state, and local government agency. It hits every person, individual out there who may be part of a cyber attack. A couple of years ago, we had that attack where the adversaries compromised home devices, baby monitors, DVRs. They took control and they used those devices as part of a massive distributed denial of service attack. So how do we get by and survive? That's the, the real test, I think, that we have to look at. And we've got many, many new things on the horizon. You just heard the last panel about artificial intelligence and machine learning. But I would remind everybody that those are just computer programs, and if they're running on an untrusted operating system, the adversary will control your AI and your machine learning as well. So everything is about the stack. The stack goes from the application to the middleware, to the operating system, to the integrated circuits, out to the network. So how can we get our arms around this problem and start to defend our cyberspace in the future. That's really what this discussion is all about today. And it's not going to be easy, but we've had big challenges before. My favorite moment of history, I think I might have mentioned this last year, is I go back a long time during the 1960s. We were in a, the missile race with the old Soviet Union. And President Kennedy had a very famous speech. He came on the air and said, we are going to go to the moon and do other things before the end of this decade, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. He was talking about an existential kinetic threat back in 1961. In 2018, we have an existential cyber threat. We talk about it all the time. It's in every boardroom. It's the top of the talk of the Pentagon. But the real question in my mind is, what are we going to do on the ground to start to make things better? And we're not going to solve this problem all at once. It's not going to be a magic bullet. There is no magic silver lining to all this. It's going to be basic hard work. It's going to require great, not good, great leadership. Leaders that are willing to make tough decisions. 
and limit the attack surface, getting that infrastructure simpler so we can defend what we deploy. And so one of the key takeaways today I'd like you to think about, in the future, don't think about your entire IT infrastructure as a flat file. Start to think about things that are critical versus things that are not critical. And when we start to apply our tools and our techniques and our science and our engineering to those things that are critical, we absolutely can defend that kind of infrastructure. But you have to be willing to reduce the attack surface. And right now, as of today, we have not been willing to do that. And you've all heard about the ongoing series of attacks. The most recent one, it breaks my heart as a, as a retired military guy. I spent 20 years in the Army. And I know today those weapon systems that we're giving to our warfighters, they are very innovative, but they also are very dependent on those same computers, those same vulnerabilities, that same untrusted software and firmware that we're sticking into every iPhone and every Samsung and every tablet. Some of that same stuff is going into weapon systems. And I, I agree strongly with what someone said this morning. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability we focused on confidentiality a lot in the past. Integrity is where the action is today. Whether it's a smart weapon system, you will not have confidentiality or availability if you can ensure the integrity of the software that's driving those weapon systems, the medical devices, the power plants. This is all part of the same problem. So how do we do this and get our arms around a very large problem? We have a lot of information technology in the federal government. Our strategy is to get simpler and to try to move some things to shared services. And so instead of having 24 federal agencies that do separate email systems or separate HR systems or payroll systems, let's do one and have one agency run it for all the rest of the feds. And then let's try to take advantage of cloud services where we can move some of our functions and our, our data to the FedRAMP approved cloud, where they, those cloud providers have deployed legions of security controls and had those controls assessed by independent third party assessment organizations. It's all about trust. And then what's left behind could be your high value assets. These are the critical assets that maybe you don't want to send to the cloud. Maybe they're not worthy of a shared service. High value assets. We have to separate those high value assets into their own domain. This is not about putting everything into one domain, it's about figuring out what's critical and moving it to a safer, more secure domain. I call that the safe deposit box model. That's the closest analogy. We have safe deposit boxes. You can't put all your important stuff in there, but you figure out some way to reduce those critical assets down to a number that can get in that box. And you put stuff there whether it's jewelry or your valuables, your coin collection, papers that you don't want to lose, we figure it out. And that increases the level of penetration resistance through the bank, the vault, the guards, all the things that are there. It's called defense in depth, layered defense. And we have to be able to start thinking in two different modes to get our arms around this problem. So it's all about managing complexity. And that's, you'll hear the term resiliency. That's a very, very important term to walk away from this discussion today. It's not good enough anymore to think we can stop all cyber attacks. And we've talked for decades about managing risk and stopping attacks. We know that high-end adversaries and sometimes not so high-end adversaries are gonna get in, even to our best federal agencies who do this for a living. Don't forget, one NSA contractor a few years ago compromised a single credential and was managed to get all the way through the NSA system of systems and exfiltrate gigabytes of top secret information. And those are the folks that know how to do this for a living. So it all goes back to first principles. And one of the themes you're gonna see from the Risk Management Framework 2.0, we have built a multi-functional framework that is going to deal with cybersecurity, which we've always done since the RMF was invented back in 2005 or 6. And we're now building a framework that can handle security, privacy, supply chain, engineering, the cybersecurity framework, 
and the communication with the C-suite up and down the stack. And I'm gonna take you through a very quick tour today and show you how this is all gonna happen. These are the three simple words that we have to try to achieve. This is a goal state. Simplify means paring down the IT infrastructure to only those essential things that you need for mission essential operations. That's hard to do. That's why whitelisting is harder than blacklisting. Blacklisting is now going out of favor because you can't pile up enough of the bad sites and all the bad programs that are out there. It overwhelms. Whitelisting is only letting things execute, programs, executables that you can trust. And that means least functionality, least privilege, two of our fundamental concepts of cybersecurity that we've known about for four decades and are very seldom practiced today. And one of the messages I try to convey is, look, we know how to solve these problems. This is not a desperation move. It's going back to the fundamentals. Some, I heard this morning the, the term blocking and tackling. And whether you're on the Denver Broncos or you're at a high school downtown in Denver or Colorado Springs, the first two weeks in August are working on the fundamentals of football practice, blocking and tackling. It doesn't make a difference if it's pros or high school kids. They understand that to be successful, you have to work and master the fundamentals. And those fundamentals are the core things that we shouldn't even be talking about in 2018, but we're still talking about them. Least functionality, least privilege, two-factor authentication. Do you realize two-factor authentication could stop 50% of the successful cyber attacks today? That's phenomenal. And it's not that hard to do anymore. It's something that should be right at our fingertips. Innovation, you heard about machine learning and AI, those are wonderful new technologies. However, they have to be integrated smartly on a trusted platform. As I said before, the adversary likes to get low in the stack. If they can compromise your operating system, there is no such thing as a trusted application when your operating system is compromised. And I heard some great things this morning. There are lots of ways to limit the damage the adversary can do. We assume they're gonna get in today the question is, if your penetration resistance fails, how do you limit the damage they can do and make the system resilient, which means it can continue to operate even in a degraded or debilitated state? And you heard this morning as well, we have two ways to do that. There's one way to do it in time and one in space. In time, you can use virtualization techniques. You heard this morning, micro-virtualization virtual machines. That's where you churn the infrastructure faster than that malicious code can actually do damage because the adversaries have to get in, they have to understand the environment, and they have to have time to do the exfiltration or bring down the capability. And if you are churning those virtual machines at a fast enough pace, at a small enough level of detail, it doesn't make any difference if they get in because they can't do anything. The other thing you can do is domain separation. Instead of having everything stored in a flat file, the OPM database is a great example of large data sets that once they get in, once the adversary compromises a single credential, they escalate privileges and they march across that system looking for the, the critical assets that you want to protect. And then they may even use a transit of it and go from system to system. So if you separate your critical data into its own domain and you set up different domains, you can then make sure that those domains are authenticated from domain to domain. So it takes the adversary, it's really miserable. They have to authenticate every way they wanna go through that system, every step of the way. And it becomes almost too much work to do. But we don't do that. We pile all that gigabyte and terabytes of data end to end, and we just let the adversary rip through the house and burn the thing down. We know how to solve this problem. So we've been working for the past year on RMF 2.0. Risk Management Framework, it's NIST Special Publication 837, Revision 2. We've nicknamed it RMF 2.0. It is the only framework in the world that I'm aware of, and I've looked at almost every one of them, that has integrated security, privacy, and supply chain and engineering into one framework. What we're trying to do is what was talked about this morning. Cybersecurity for way too long has been a stovepipe. 
we have a CISO, and it's that stovepipe of security that the board members are talking about, the chairman of the board, and they're all around the big table, rubbing their hands together, trying to figure out how to build better defenses. And then the, qu the question is, what action actually comes out of that? Cybersecurity shouldn't be a silo. It should be part of the core of every organization today. And in order to do that, the leaders have to realize that since you are living by the technology and becoming more innovative and more productive, that is a double-edged sword because that same technology that makes you a great Fortune 500 company can bring you down in a nanosecond. And once you internalize that basic idea, then you'll be in the right mindset to make some of the tough decisions. Because if you don't have that mindset, you don't have strong leaders. And you can ask any one of these warfighters in the audience today, what makes the American military the greatest in the world? It's three things. It's great leadership, great technology, and great training. Those are the three things. And by the way, it breaks my heart. I, it was, wasn't only a month and a half ago when the latest Chinese attack happened on our Navy submarine program. Now, it's not bad enough. They've already stolen the design documentation for the F-35. Now they've gotten to our advanced submarine program. Now the implication of this is very, very long. It's far-reaching. It's like the OPM attack. That's an intergenerational breach. All of my information that was used to determine if I was worthy of a top secret SCI clearance, and I've had a lot of information in that file for years. That is all in the hands of the adversary now. And I think I said this last year. They launched three attacks in 2015 that were very targeted. They went after OPM. They wanted all the top, they wanted all the SF-86 data of all those people who had top secret and top secret SEI clearances. Then they went after Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. They wanted all the healthcare, federal healthcare records. And then they went after Ashley Madison. That's one that I, I mentioned last year. And it gets a big laugh because nobody wanted to admit they're in that database, but the adversary knows there's a percentage of those people that are in that database. And they wanted to do a query on, give me all the federal employees with top secret clearances, embarrassing health care problems, and who are cheating on their spouses. That's a formula and a playbook for espionage that is going to live on for multiple generations. All of my kids and all of my friends who are in that database because of all those background investigations, that stuff is never coming back. Just like the Navy Advanced Submarine Program, that information is never coming back. And it puts our warfighters at great risk because this is an economic security issue and a national security issue at the same time. Those two topics are now blended into one because you can't have a strong economy if you are hemorrhaging IP, intellectual property. Our great companies who are innovating, not just giving us the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, but they're also giving us the great cutting edge defense technology. Some of this is cutting edge stuff that's not even classified yet but it's gonna go through a life cycle process as it moves its way from that bright idea in that garage with two guys at MIT into an advanced weapon system that's gonna be on the battlefield in 2024. If you lose that now, the adversaries will do two things. They will start to make their own without having to invest all the R&D, and they will also start to work on countermeasures that are gonna put those warfighters in harm's way and it's all unnecessary. We have to get our arms around the problem. And so 853 and 837 are two tools I'm gonna to talk about today that can help you, help you get your, keep the guardrails up, give you a structure and a process that you can use to start to win the game instead of losing all the time. You know, we don't have that much time left because once this spin cycle starts, it kind of accelerates and it can be an exponential curve to the, off the cliff. And so, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, and now the reason we did RMF 2.0, you can see that that six-step RMF now has a very important seventh step. It's called the prepare step, and you heard this this morning. One of our big failures is our inability to prepare properly for the cyber battle, the cyber war, which every one of us are involved in today, whether you know it or not. 
If your system hasn't been breached, you probably are, are going to be breached at some time in the future, or you don't know the adversary is buried in the system. There, the advanced persistent threat has a very stealthy property to it. And we worry about this in our power plants. Just because they haven't pulled the trigger doesn't mean they can't pull the trigger at a time of their choice. So that RMF repair step is one that is very innovative. It's going to make sure that the C-suite now is fully engaged and doing everything they're supposed to do before they hand it off to the system owners. Gone are the days of blaming the CISO or the CIO or the system owner for the cyber breach because the enterprise failed to engage in a meaningful way. So this is going to start way back at the boardroom. And seven objectives, and I'm going to run through these very quickly, but you're going to get a sense after you see the seven objectives why RMF 2.0 is so powerful and why it's so essential to getting us on the right track. The first objective I just mentioned, we have to be able to get those people around the board room table not just talking about cyber attacks, but understanding how vulnerable we really are. And what are some of the essential things we have to do to get healthy besides just putting up another firewall that's going to fail? There's lots of, the, there, the ground is littered with security safeguards that have failed for so many reasons. The phishing attacks are one, just one example of how we haven't done the appropriate training. Getting back to the military example, leadership, technology, and training. We have to establish a tight linkage between the C-suite and the operators. One team, one mission. And, the, and the, the military is a great example of how this works. The commander's intent is conveyed from the flag officer level all the way down to the squad leader and the folks who are digging the trenches. I'm an Army guy, so we're digging, we're digging foxholes. The Air Force guys might not be doing that. But that's the commander's intent, conveyed up and down the chain, not just one way. It goes down, and then the status reports come back up, and that's how you manage a dynamic battle space, which is what we're talking about with cyber today. Number two, let's get rid of cybersecurity as a stovepipe. I can't wait for the day where we don't need CISOs anymore. Why? Because security and privacy and supply chain risk management, they're all built into the normal ways the organization does business. It's part of the enterprise architecture. It's part of the system development life cycle. It's part of everything, it's part of acquisition. Everything we do, it's hardwired, which means those cybersecurity professionals are not going to go away. They're just not huddled in the CISO's office anymore. They're distributed into all those places where they can serve as advisors. So when those RFPs go out, you can have a security person there say, you know, your security requirements are not well defined. And the fact they're not well defined means you're not going to get what you need. That's the kind of decentralization we need in our organizations to be successful. That's institutionalizing cybersecurity. Operationalizing is the, the ops in the spectrum. It's once all these things are institutionalized, they will produce systems that are more trustworthy and operators who understand the limits of what we built. Understanding risk is not just accepting risk. It's about really understanding what the bad guys can do and how I can be resilient in the face of these unrelenting cyber attacks. Many of you have heard a lot about the cybersecurity framework. It's been around for about four years now. You can consider it a risk management framework. It was built primarily for the critical infrastructure because we had our own framework, which is the RMF. However, the federal government now is being required to do both frameworks. So one of the things you're going to get with RMF 2.0, we took apart the entire cybersecurity framework. And we tried to align everything in the CSF with every step in the RMF that we could. So you can now use the risk management framework, and you can take advantage of all the grid things that you find in the cybersecurity framework and bring those into a full risk management framework, which has everything from identifying what controls you need to implementing, assessing, authorizing for operation, and then going to continuous monitoring. It's a very powerful way to integrate the best of both frameworks. This is a big one. 
In 2013, in our 800-53 control catalog, for the first time, NIST put a set of privacy controls in an appendix in the back of 853. When it came time to update 853, we've been going through the update now for a couple of years. This is a major update. It's the fifth revision for 853. We are going through a full privacy integration into all of our FISMA-related publications. That includes 837, the risk management framework. It includes 853. It includes 839, the enterprise-wide risk management framework. You see what we're doing is, we're using a single framework in both communities, the security community and the privacy community, two very different worlds. They can now use the same framework to select controls, implement, authorize. And the other big news is we're not just doing a security authorization anymore. The authorization decision has moved up a level. It's, it looks more like an enterprise-wide risk management decision because it's going to include risk from security, risk from privacy, and also risk from a supply chain. You see, now we're moving that decision making up to the level that we need to have it so you can make those credible risk-based decisions and not micromanage and stovepipe this where it may get lost in the weeds somewhere downstream. This is one of my favorites. I've been on this soapbox for a long time. My roots go back to the National Security Agency in 1990. I was around when I was in charge of a division that produced the, the Rainbow Series. They were produced before I got there, but I was there when that work was coming forward. That was our first attempt to work with industry on building trusted operating systems. And we built a lot of those things. Industry actually built many trusted operating systems. And for whatever reason, the technology moved on, and that body of work is still there. But we've lost four decades of the principles, the concepts, the foundational things we need to do to build stronger, more penetration resistant, more trustworthy, resilient systems. We built the first system security engineering publication in 2016. We used an international standard. It was an ISO IEEE standard for systems engineering. And we laid out a roadmap for every one of those 30 process steps in the international standard on what do security people do, or what do system engineers do when you get to this step of the engineering process. It's all there. It's the same way we build bridges and the way we build airplanes. If we were to use our same science and engineering and mathematics and all the things that we know in the STEM sciences, if we brought all that body of knowledge and all those smart people, we could build more trustworthy software and systems. They'd be smaller, they would do less things, but they wouldn't fall down. Bridges, bridges collapse very rarely today. Airplanes fall out of the sky very rarely. And why is that? Because we have good engineers designing those aircraft and those bridges, quality products. And if something does fail, we can trace it back to a root cause analysis. We need to start doing those same things with our systems and our software because we've totally missed the boat there and we're paying the price big time today. And this goes back to what I talked about. I've, I believe we have kind of a blind spot and I think some of it is due to the compelling nature of the technology. All of us are addicted to that technology and sometimes we just don't want to have this conversation. But at some point in time, we're getting very close to that time now whether it's elections or power plants or medical devices or weapon systems, the fact that the adversaries know as much as they do about us and we have as many vulnerabilities, and you heard about it last hour and the hour before, you cannot hunt your way out of this problem because there's too much attack surface and there are too many vulnerabilities. You can fix 100 and I'll bring you back 200 tomorrow. And that curve is going to grow exponentially. The only way you get out of this problem is good engineering. So what we did... We're trying to bring two worlds together. The world of system and security engineers, they're over here, and there's the RMF group over here. We took and we aligned every place we could all of those engineering and secure engineering concepts with every step in the risk management framework where we could. The idea is if you're building a system now, you can look at the RMF and you can see at what point in the engineering process do I select my security controls? 
And all of those decisions that you make in an engineering process, that now is going to be visible through both sides of the lens. And that's a pretty powerful way to go. By the way, we just introduced volume two of the 8160 engineering process. It's a, it's a draft. It's called cyber resiliency. If you want to know how to make your systems more cyber resilient, it works for new systems development, or it also works for 95% of you out there today who have all that installed base. You have what you have. We assume in 8160 volume two, the, the APT, the Advanced Persistent Threat is already inside your system. And we give you lots of things you can do to limit the damage they can do once they're inside. So check it out. It's in draft right now, but it might be very useful. We'll be linking those same cyber resiliency concepts and techniques and approaches to all of our security controls in 853 Rev 5. So you'll be able to get those resiliency concepts and safeguards from 800-53 Rev 5, or you'll be able to get them from that cyber resiliency guideline. Supply chain, huge deal. We have a supply chain that is literally strung out across the globe. It's becoming a huge problem. Why? It's the black box phenomenon. When you look down at your smartphone or your tablet, that's all you see is the user interface. It's a black box. Most of us don't have a clue what's going on inside that black box. There was a time when we used to build all of our own computer chips here in the United States. And then they moved offshore. We had a couple of trusted foundries. I don't even know if we do that anymore. But when you're outsourcing all this stuff to places far beyond, you're importing all that software, and it's going into very critical systems, and all you know about it, this thing is a black box of complexity, then you don't know what you don't know. It's a huge problem. We have to start getting our arms around, how do we manage the supply chain risk? Now, this is not going to be a silver bullet, but we've integrated supply chain into the risk management framework. It's going to be part of the authorization decision. You're going to have to have a supply chain risk management plan. What components are you bringing into that system? What do you know about those? Are they single points of failure? How much can I trust that, that particular component? Are there other sources? I'll give you one quick example. An operating system, they're in everything today. Believe it or not, there's an operating system in the B-1 bomber. You probably wouldn't be surprised to know that it's not Windows 10. It's an operating system, but it's a very small operating system. It's, I'm not going to give you the brand name. I don't want to promote the product, but it's a very small kernel-based operating system. It's highly trusted. It's common criteria evaluated, I think, EAL 6 level, which is next to the highest. Very small, very trusted. Why? Because you don't need an operating system that has 70 million lines of code and does 100,000 different things. You need to have only the things that the B-1 bomber needs to do to get off the ground, deliver its ordinance, and fight the battle and come home safely. We used to have a metaphor at NSA called the trusted garage door opener. It's a real small device. It's got a really tiny amount of code, but it does one thing. It opens my garage door and it closes it with 100% assurance. You see, we have to be able to thin out these functions, get rid of all the unnecessary stuff, and build systems with that least functionality, least privilege mentality. And we have to be comfortable that that's OK. That's why I talked about this is a two-way street now. That one of the earlier speakers talked about the fork in the road. I think Dan Gear talked about fork in the road. That fork in the road for me is going to be dividing the world up into critical stuff and non-critical stuff. And when you go down the critical road, you're going to be doing stuff a lot differently than we're doing today. And that's part of the RMF story. So you're going to find supply chain front and center in RMF 2.0. Last one. For many, many years, we've selected our controls on a concept called the baseline concept. Back in 2003, under FISMA, the Congress asked NIST to develop a minimum set of controls for all federal agencies. So we decided to go with what we call the triage concept. Every agency had to categorize their data and their systems into one of three buckets. High impact, moderate impact, and low impact, where impact was impact to mission or business if the system got compromised. 
Well, those three buckets, there was a, a basic set of controls associated with every one of those baselines. So that, that was the baseline for low, baseline for moderate, baseline for high. You would start with that set of controls, and then you would tailor, which means throw some controls out, bring some more in, until you came to a steady state. And that would then go into your security plan. And then you would implement those controls, you would assess them, come back and do the authorization. We are now giving you another way to do your control selection. It's called organization-generated controls. Let's say you're in the DOD and you're building a new weapon system. And the guys over in the DOD, the A-10 office, said they're working on a, an engineering process. They're in the stakeholder requirements definition part of the process. The warfighters are sitting around the table. What does this weapon system have to do? How do we put steel on target? How long is it going to take to build it? How much is it going to cost? Out of that process comes system requirements for that weapon system. And then some of those requirements are going to ask the question, how do we protect this weapon system from integrity, availability, all the things you talk about. And out of that set of requirements for security, that's where you'll be selecting your security controls. It's a, to it's a top down approach. And it's very different. And we're giving you now the ability to do things from both ends of the spectrum. This is common sense security. It involves some tough decisions, strong leadership, but I believe we can get there. This is what the privacy and security framework look like together. Just very quickly, for those of you who wonder how security and privacy are different, how they're alike, security and privacy share a common bond when it comes to one of the three objectives of, of the cybersecurity. It's called confidentiality. The privacy information, PII, personally identifiable information, privacy professionals worry that that's not uh, disclosed and authorized individuals, just like we do. That's a common bond. But privacy officials also worry about what can authorized individuals do. You have a lot of people in your organization who are authorized to look at your PII. We have controls in the new catalog in Rev 5 coming out soon that will talk about what can authorized people do. How much information can they collect on you? How long should they be able to keep it? What can they do with it? All those are privacy issues that go beyond security. We've integrated all this into one risk management framework. That's how those things are alike. So here's what we're building. We're building a multifunctional risk management framework that looks more like an enterprise-wide framework than it does just a security framework. It's got the three big ticket items, security, privacy, supply chain. It integrates the communications mechanisms from the C-suite down to the operators. It aligns with the cybersecurity framework. And it brings in the necessary things so the engineers can start talking in the same terms as the enterprise-wide professionals. All wrapped up into one framework. So very quickly, in my four minutes to go, I'm just going to give you a sense. Remember that prepare step that sits right in the center? I'm just going to run through these very quickly. There's two types of prepare tasks that are in that, though, that prepare step. One takes an organizational perspective. So you're going to see things like defining your risk management roles and responsibilities. That's pretty darn important. All of these activities at the enterprise level set the stage for the system owners and the operators. In other words, this is preparing the battlefield so they can be successful downstream. You can see developing a risk management strategy and your risk tolerance. All those things are things that system owners shouldn't be doing or they can't do. They don't have that enterprise-wide perspective. Risk assessments across the enterprise before you get down to the risk assessment at the system level. Making sure you tailor the baselines ahead of time so every system owner doesn't have to struggle with what controls do I need. They can get the enterprise-wide, the commander's view from the top, and then they can push those down to the system owners without having all that work go on over and over and over again. We also select our common controls at the enterprise level. Those are the controls provided by the enterprise that are inherited by every system owner. The guards, guns, and gates, the personnel security, all those things that system owners will never, ever see. That's what the enterprise has to do before they can turn to the system owners and say, go ahead and do your thing. So you see there's a whole bunch of these things 
that really prepared the battlefield for the system owner. Now we get to the system owner. There's preparation there too. What mission or business function is this system going to be supporting? Whether it's a weapon system or a medical device or whatever it is, you have to start with the mission and the business because you're going to build a system that's going to be supporting that mission or business with hopefully trustworthy information technology, or at least you know enough about it so you can understand if it fails, how do I go back to a known secure state or a known state and continue to operate? Identifying your critical assets. This goes back to the fork in the road I talked about. Everything's not a flat file. We've got to be able to decide, and sometimes it's difficult to get people to say, what are your critical assets? Where is that secret sauce? If you can't do that, you're never going to have enough time or money or people to do what's right for those critical assets. You determine what the authorization boundary is. What am I willing to sign up for as far as what am I willing to protect? What's within my sphere of responsibility? Information is everywhere today. Understanding the life cycle of the information, how it gets created, what happens to it over time. There's a brand new task, I think it's P13. Every information element, every information type has to be understood so you can track that life cycle all the way from the time it's generated to the time it's disposed of and everything in between. So, here are some of the things in the life cycle I described. These are coming out of 800-160. These are the 14 system engineering, the technical life cycle processes. And this is where you're going to see a strong alignment with the risk management framework. Everything from defining requirements to implementation, architecture, all of the things that make a better bridge and a better airplane we now can do with our systems and our software. Not easy, it's a heavy lift, but it's the only thing that's gonna allow us to get to the place where we have transparency, traceability, you know what those two things are, transparency, tracing requirements from the stakeholder all the way down to where those requirements are satisfied at the end of the stack, way down the lowest part of the stack, traceability, making sure that you have transparency and traceability will give you the ability to have more trustworthiness. And that trustworthiness, I would argue, is the essential component of going forward into the 21st century and taking advantage of this great technology. For if you don't have trust in this technology, I don't care how good it is, how many bells and whistles you bring to the table, how good those smart weapons are, if they're not trustworthy and reliable when you want to put steel on target, then it doesn't make any difference how many bells and whistles they have, because they will fail at a time of the adversary's choosing. Our documents out for public comment. I'll close with this slide. You can go to the website and send us your public comments. These slides will be available through the NCC. I hope they'll, uh, you can ask for the PowerPoint. I'll be glad to send you a copy. Uh, I've got my, uh, my contact information on the very last slide. And let me wrap up with another 30 seconds here. This is obvious. We're working as hard as we can work right now. We've got to do something different. This is the definition of insanity, what we've been doing up to this point. We've got to start doing things differently. I started with leadership. It's also about governance and accountability. With these three things, if we're able to master these three things, everything else will fall into place, and it will give us the ability to protect ourselves in the 21st century, defend through cyberspace. And I hope if I leave you with one final thought today, Every morning I get up and I walk my dog. She's adopted. She's a pit bull rescue from two years old. I love her to death, best, best friend in the world. And when I walk outside and I look around and I, I take a big deep breath of freedom. Now that may sound a little bit corny to some people, but I understand this technology implicitly and I understand how it's used and I'm part of a very large federal government and I've, been, I've toured every government agency, I know how vulnerable we are. And I also know how precious and fragile our freedom is today. You heard the other speakers this morning talking and this afternoon talking about the election security and how some of the, a lot of the adversaries are trying to breach our, not just our universities, 
to steal our advanced innovative technologies. They're going into our companies, our Fortune 500 companies. They're buying up our companies to acquire the technology. This is the quintessential problem of the 21st century. It is the existential threat. And so when somebody says that security and privacy are not directly linked to freedom, I would argue with them with every breath I have in my body because they are so much linked together. I think Dan Gere said the same thing this morning. The good news is we have smart people and we've been up against, our backs have been up against the wall before and the one thing about the American people I know, we will always be in it till the, till the end and we will prevail in the end, but we have to get our A game together and we have to do it soon. Thank you so much for being patient today. This is my contact information. You can hit me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. That's my email address. Uh, send me email, you can call me anytime, and that is my cell phone, by the way, and that cell phone operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even though I'm retired from the military, I still operate with the warfighter's schedule, just like you guys do. As taxpayers, you've paid my salary. We're grateful for everything you do. Thank you for doing everything you do to help make a stronger, more secure country. Have a great conference, Brady. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. <laughs>